just take a deep breath and let it put a sound. Ah. Oh. Ah. Oh. What a glorious day. And we have our window. We have our door. So in our new location, one of the elements of the vision is natural light in the sanctuary. So today we have natural light in the sanctuary. So our topic today, from tipping points to turning points, and it's right out of Greg Braden's book, The Resilient Heart, subtitle, Living, let's see, Thriving Through Times of Extremes. I don't know what he's talking about, times of extremes, but let's, let's look into that a little bit. So he says, he asks this question, how do we turn our time of simultaneous crises and extremes, also known as tipping points, into a time of transformation or turning points? So let's break it down a little bit. Ethel and Joseph went, how do we do that? So let's break it down to it. What might we be referring to right now as crises? Do we anything? Come to mind. Oh, let's see. Uh, hurt some world leaders, we might say. There's a crisis. What else? The environment. The environment. Democracy. Democracy. World poverty. Homelessness. Homelessness. Human rights. Say what? Refugees. Refugees. Human rights. Human rights. Mental illness. Prisons. Prisons, education, education. Emotional, illness. emotional illness, our food, our food. food insecurity. <clears throat> Let's take a deep breath. You chose to be here at a very important moment in human history. What might we mean by turning points? Those crises, those are our tipping points. What might be the turning points? Solutions. Solutions. Somebody said something here. Turning points. Awakening. Awakening. Turning points. What might those be? Meditation. Meditation. Conversations. Conversations, possibly with people we wouldn't ordinarily have conversations with. Prayer. Prayer. Cooperation. Cooperation. Standing up for our truth. Standing up for our truth. Understanding. Understanding. Finding ways to the peace table. Kindness. Unity. 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 Yeah. Forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Acceptance. Acceptance. Mm -hmm. Authentic self. Authentic self. So all the turning points we're noting are turning points of the inner. And then out of the inner come solutions that show up in the outer, right? Interesting how that works. We should start a whole movement called New Thought, <laughs> where we have as part of our uh, teachings that what we're thinking impacts what we're seeing in the world. It might be similar to what Mahatma Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world. So I think we're in good shape. We're, we're pointing to the essential, the, the absolute essence of all the work. It starts within. I'll be at the marches. I'll sign the petitions. I'll call my people in Congress. If I'm not doing my work on the inner, then it's not going to be as authentic. Does that sound right? So we're in the perfect topic, tipping points to turning points, crises to transformation, because this Wednesday, we start a season called Lent, where we, even though we are new thought and we honor all the truth and all the great spiritual paths, we are founded on Christianity, and Lent comes out of pre-Christian and then Christian teachings. You all know what to do on Tuesday, party like crazy, because Wednesday, <laughs> because Wednesday is traditionally when we begin to leave off those things in our life, or at least one thing in our life, that might be harmful or detrimental. So 
For me always, Lent now represents a time to really practice new thought and to give up the thoughts that are not serving me or my global family. So Lent's always very busy for me as I'm doing that inner work. So, tipping our canoes. Talk about tipping points. Some of you have heard this little story. It's in our book. But it's one of those stories that always wants to be repeated now and then, especially when we're talking about tipping. We all try to keep our canoes upright, usually. <laughs> Although I know people who jump out of rafts on purpose on on uh, rafting trips. But canoes, we try to keep them upright. But a lot of us, we have found, we work very hard to keep our canoes upright, like what, our financial canoes, our relationship canoes, what else, our health canoes, emotional our emotional canoes. We try very hard to keep them upright. Right now, I feel like our whole country, that, that the canoe's been tipping for a while, and it's, it's, it's tipped. That's okay, because canoes can be uprighted again. So this is a story about David and I used to lead canoe trips on the rivers in Colorado. And on one particular trip, were you with, on this one, Pam, the infamous, everybody's going to tip the first hour trip? Okay, so it had rained a lot in Colorado where we were living at the time and because it had rained so much the rivers were really high because the rivers were really high the river guide didn't see all that he needed to see about the river at that particular point this particular group of about 25 or 30 of us were mostly psychotherapists, psychologists, a few psychiatrists and so we're out we start our five-day canoe trip, and it's the first hour of the first day. And we approach the part of the river where five canoes went right over submerged pillow rocks. So it's right below the water, big rocks. And so I was just working so hard to keep my canoe upright, but we kind of went over in slow motion. We just sort of went... <laughs> into the water we went. Five canoes, one running into the other, one right after the other. And the canoe guide is going, the first hour of a five-day canoe trip, so we've got five canoes tipped, one submerged that he was out trying to get upright again. So I'm hanging on the side of my canoe. And my canoe partner, he's hanging on the side of the canoe too. And I'm thinking, this is not the way I plan my day <laughs> to be tipped in this canoe. And then I looked off in the distance and there were people turning around coming back to help us. I thought, that's good. Help's on the way. You know, it's always good to see that help's on the way. And then as I'm hanging onto the canoe, I thought, well, you know, I worked so hard to keep my canoe from tipping. You know, I almost had like other people were tipping before me and I was like having a canoe tipping attitude, you know, like, this isn't so hard, why are they tipping? <laughs> so I'm hanging on the side of canoe, thus thinking the water's cool, it's a hot day, that's not so bad. And then I looked up and overhead there were two golden eagles circling. I'd never seen golden eagles before. And I thought, I'm so glad I tipped. Because I was working so hard to keep my canoe upright that I wasn't looking up. There's a teachable moment. We work so hard to keep our canoes from tipping that we don't look up. So I looked up and there they were, two golden eagles. I thought, oh, so glad I tipped. And then I remembered that, that morning into our canoe, they had tied the group it's called the honey pot. <laughs> so when you go into the wilderness, you take your gear in and you take all the stuff out. You always want to leave your campsites clean. So we had, and I, I'm sorry if this offends anybody, but you know it's part of going into the wilderness. So we had a big bucket with a lid 
And that was our group toilet. And when it came time to leave the area, we would strap it into the canoe, strap it in, tie it in, really <laughs> tight, thankfully. <laughs> and I, I want to skip to the end of the story. Everything was okay. You know, the, t the group toilet was tied in, strapped in, buckled in. So we were okay that way. But I thought, isn't this just perfect? I'm not only floating down the river with my stuff. <laughs> and you know, that's the way it is sometimes. <laughs> Not only float down the river with my stuff, I've got, I float down the river with everybody's stuff. You know, we carry the stuff. <laughs> now this is a funny story, maybe an offensive story to some of you, but if you're going to go into the wilderness, you got to take care of what's yours. you got to do what's right. <clears throat> but what it taught me is this. My canoe's going to tip from time to time. I have to remember, like David's meditation, I am surrounded by love and healthy presence, and I'm okay. And if I remember to look up around me, I'm going to see blessings. I'm going to see golden eagles. I'm going to feel the cool water. I'm going to be okay. Help surrounds me. I'm okay. Because sometimes, and right now in the world when the canoes are tipping, a lot of us are forgetting we're actually okay. Evolution is not a clean and sparkly process. Childbirth is not a clean and easy process. And we're in the middle right now of the tipping point so it can feel really messy and hard. Is that okay to talk about? So the canoe of the world has tipped a bit. But turning points bring awareness of oneness. More of us, I would be willing to bet in this room, are more aware of how closely the world is connected in oneness more than ever right now. And part of that awareness has come because of the canoes tipping in every human arena. And we get it may not have been a spiritual awareness to begin with. We get how globally connected we are. And we really get that when refugees are dying of starvation and war, and we really get what, how it feels, how would we feel if it were us and our families. And so we open our hearts. We may not know all the solutions and all the answers, but we open our hearts to the empathy and the compassion and from that place to know what to do. So turning points bring an awareness of oneness. One of the things Greg Braden says in times of tipping points, if you pay attention, nature always makes room for new possibilities and positive change. Nature will heal herself if we let her. It's been seen over and over and over. This is just one small picture of a rainforest that we hiked in in Costa Rica, and that was our friend the sloth hanging out with us. This was a rainforest which at one time in the 60s was a cattle ranch. Thousands of acres of cattle being raised, and they let it go back to the wild. They thought it would be a hundred years before the rainforest returned in full. It took 30 years, and they were calling it a rainforest again. Nature will take care of herself if we let her. So, Lao Tzu, Chinese philosopher, said, if you do not change direction, you may end up where you are heading. <laughs> I could have said that and been remembered forever and ever. <laughs> have you ever had that, that insight? If I don't change direction right now, I'm going to get to where I'm going. Anybody can think of a place where we might need to shift direction in the world right now? So here's one great thing Jackie posted on Facebook about the vertical forest. She posted the ones that are being built in China. I didn't even know these things existed. I've been shopping vertical gardens for my deck. Vertical, you know, uh, flower pots. This is whole buildings. These exist in Italy and other, in Switzerland and Sweden, and now they're building them in China as a solution 
to the enormous amounts of carbon dioxide. Isn't that amazing? This is a turning point. Whoever thought of this was not thinking in the regular way. <laughs> and that's what turning points bring us, tipping points. Bring us a stress, a kind of anxiety, a kind of uneasiness and uncertainty. And then some of us want to start opening to answers that maybe we haven't seen before. And that's what turning points can bring. This is just one piece of good news at Tuesday night's class that we're having. Part of what we're doing is bringing some reports of helpful solutions that are happening in the world. This is just one. Thank you, Jackie. So along with discovering who we are and answers to our deeper questions, we also begin to change our questions. Example. What can I get from the world that exists? That's a question that's been in the world for a long time. And now it's changing for many to what can I give to or share with or contribute to the world that is emerging? What do we have that most matches what the world most needs? Love. Love. So here's one simple example of that love, what the world needs now. Now, some of y'all may have seen this already on YouTube or Facebook. Turn it up a wee bit, y'all. If you wonder what you can do, this is one small example. to repair the graves. 
give the money to repair the graves in that Jewish cemetery. It's a turning point when you and I feel forgiveness or understanding for someone who felt like a former enemy. It's a turning point when we make a decision to surrender <coughs> to the ever unfolding flow of evolution in the universe, even when it looks messy. And instead of closing our hearts, our turning point is to keep our hearts open, even in the midst of the things we do not understand and the things that seem to be breaking our hearts. That's a turning point. This was from last Sunday. Somebody asked me to put the slide up again and it's worth putting up again. Charles Fillmore wrote a book called The Atom Smashing Power of the Brain, of the Mind. And he asked this question, where in Jesus' teachings shall we find the formula to offset or dissolve or to meet and nullify the atomic bomb. That's what was on his mind in the 1940s when he wrote this book. But we might put something else in the blank. What would it take to offset crises or extremes? So he found this. He said, the formula that Jesus gave is this. We shall love, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. He said, this is the formula. Jesus gave the formula to the attorney, the lawyer, who had asked him, what is the, the most important command? Now again, we don't know all the solutions and all the ways to make the decisions. It's going to be the next right and perfect one for us. The most important thing is we keep our hearts open to knowing what the next right step is. The tipping points are with us, and they're going to be with us for a while. You know, somebody said to me the other day, I just want to get things back to the way they were, and I had to break the news to them. <laughs> <laughs> and we really want it to go back to the way it was. Our canoes out in, the, a global, in a global way, our canoes have been tipping for a long time. Now they've tipped. So do we, do we just make the decision to not even try because it seems hopeless? Or do we remember something very important that all the research is showing now? We are wired to be extraordinary beings. We are wired to know how to move through these times of extremes and to open to the solutions that are needed for our world's transformation. We're designed and wired for that. Would you please touch your own heart? I am wired to be an extraordinary being. Did you say that? I am wired to be an extraordinary being. And that's just period paragraph in the discussion. So as we move through the times of extremes, we need to periodically pause and say, Hold on, hold on, there's a river of life within me. We might call it DNA. There's an incredible wiring within my nervous system, within my brain. I am wired to be an extraordinary presence in this time of crises and extremes. That's the way I'm wired. That's what we're opening to. So we open first for our own individual tipping points and turning points, and then that impacts the world, because the world has some tipping points that are here to stay for a while. So we're, re, we're shifting and recalibrating so as to show up, as one of our spiritual teachers says, to show up and be the Christ no matter what it looks like. Can't you just see Jesus saying, well, I can do this resurrection thing, but let me give you a few things. You're going to need to change the way it's looking. Yeah. We need to change the set design. We need to have a few other extra actors. No, he said, I, well, actually, my whole life has prepared me to be here for this moment. I'm ready. So one last story. Remember the story of Joseph and Genesis? The coat of many colors, most of us learned that if we went to a Southern Baptist church anywhere, any kind of good Protestant church. 
Joseph, the younger brother of 12, and his brothers did what? They sold him into slavery. What happened to Joseph? He ends up living in the land of the pharaohs. He was brilliant. He was an extraordinary being. He showed up for that moment, that crisis moment of poverty and famine in the land. And when his family showed up years later as refugees, asking for food because their land was, was they were coming from a land of famine. And they showed up in Egypt asking for food as refugees. And Joseph, who was the head of the Pharaoh's house, I will give you food. Bring your families. Go back home and get your father and bring him. There's food here. There's plenty. Our whole lives have prepared us for this moment. And we're ready to show up for you. And so the whole family shows up and they realize it was Joseph, the younger brother. Can you imagine? <laughs> Oy vey. <laughs> and he says this very important line, you meant evil against me, he said his brothers. The Hebrew word for meant is more translated as weave. Isn't that interesting? You wove evil, he said, but God rewove it together for good. It appears that, we're using the word evil meaning, it appears that hurtful and hurt, hurtful consciousness, hurtful ideas, unkind ideas, extreme ideas, what? With intention. With intention. We, we are called to reweave what appears to be evil detrimental, sorrowful, we are called to reweave. That where someone means something for unkindness, that we reweave it together for something good, something healing, something transformational. Does that make sense? Amen. We have, we become the weavers and we take an energy that feels frightening or terrorizing and we transmute it and transform it. We, we reweave it. Within ourselves first. Within ourselves first. Many of us talk about belief systems. Let's talk about belief waves. Every time you send a thought into the universe, it's a wave of energy. What kind of thought is it? If I see something hurtful, unkind on the television, now and then I see something's upsetting, I can dive into that energy and create a whole bunch more of it if I want. Or I can dive into it and reweave it. I was just thinking about that with the dolphins in the meditation. You know, to, to reweave with energy of light, even energy of playfulness, energy of love. Energy of open-heartedness. You and I know how to reweave the energy. And we better get about that business. That's what we're called to do. What you meant for evil, God has rewoven together for good. So let's take a deep breath. <sighs> Holding in our hearts right now all the beloveds that we're thinking of, holding in our prayer consciousness individuals, groups of people, governments, world leaders, our global family, our environment, the rivers, the oceans, holding in our hearts and our consciousness the well-being of all life, no exceptions, holding that in our consciousness. We reweave the belief waves. We reweave the feeling waves. We are extraordinary beings. This is what we're designed to be. Our whole lives, and possibly past lives, have prepared us to be in this moment. We're ready. We're ready to see the tipping points and know what is ours to do and allow the turning points to happen. The truth
through metanoia, the change of heart, the transforming of our minds, the renewing of our world, we give thanks for knowing that we're transformers in the world. We're weavers with the spirit of kindness, the spirit of love, the spirit of peace. Whole lives have prepared us. We're ready. And if our canoes tip, we look up. Spirit is there. For all of our global family, those in search of safe haven, for all of our world family, those who are in need of food or water, for all of our human family, those who are in need of safety, peace. For all of our human family. For this country. For all world leaders. We hold in our consciousness that we are extraordinary beings. We are designed to create a world that works for all. We say, so it is, and so we let it be. Namaste. Please turn to someone and say, thank you for being part of the turning point. Thank you, thank you for being part of the turning point.